so this is just a, a <clears throat> we have tomorrow, this morning we have been on the side of overview, big picture. But this has a lot of implication that we have to change our concepts. Uh, we used to fill these things because these concepts should be connected to the same systemic logic and so that you don't use old concepts on personality and on communication and things like that. Otherwise, they bring in other implications and then will, there will be a confusion. And uh, I will just show you some examples of concepts we have developed that fit the systemic approach. And this is a theater metaphor. <clears throat> um, we have, the theater metaphor has proven to be a very easily acceptable metaphor for creating reality. Because in our culture, everybody has an idea from a stage, from um, a scriptwriter, uh, of a director, of actors, of people who make the background, and of so all the business questions around theater. So uh, our experience is without introducing it explicitly, uh, you can use that language. For example, saying, um, who, for the OD project you have, uh, who, who did design the ideas for it? F how long should the process, the, the ideas designed, last? Uh, on which stages will take place what uh, we need to create as reality? Are these stages available? Is there a director who can teach actors how to play in that play and so on. And they immediately answer and take this metaphor without you have to introduce from a meta level this metaphor. And we also use the theater metaphor, and this will I uh, point to first, also as a personality model. So you can consider a personality as a portfolio of roles you play in your life, stages you enter or you are caught, uh, you are teared to. Um, you can think about what are the usual, what, what, what is the style uh, of place I am tied in and I would like better. Uh, you can Think about what are the stories that repeat and repeat again. I'm uh, involved in. Yeah. That's it. And <clears throat> everybody, and we will do an exercise on that. Everybody can easily answer these questions. And then you can explain to each other, and others see, oh, is this possible to me? I saw you in other roles. Or is it, um, when I should describe your tendency to enter what kind of stages is different than you say your tendency is, and it's different from what you do every day. So you can discuss how to change things so that your personality somehow fits better to your soul. For example, you always want to uh, get another role. Uh, but it may be the role is okay, but the play you are playing this role in is not the play that is fitting. You, you, you don't have to be a coach. It's okay that you are a manager, but you might not be a manager in, uh, on that stage you are play, playing manager now. Or you do not like the story that is uh, created on this stage. So this gives us ideas about ourselves and others give us feedback what ideas they have in which dimension to change something in order that things fit better together to your personality. And this is a total psychology-free personality model. And everybody can immediately work with that. And it's easily adopted in, in all kinds of contexts. 
And very often, for example, in our training group, we have the case that somebody comes in and says, I want to work more with humans, I'm fed up of this economic system, all this, and this, I want, this is why I want to be a consultant or a psychotherapist. And I say to him, we have unhappy psychotherapists enough. <laughs> uh, it's okay that you are looking for something what you call more human. Let's see what we could should change that you feel you have more access, what you call more human. And maybe the role is wonderful, that you are a manager. What you mean is you want to uh, create different plays that you feel are more human and then your humanity, need for humanity uh, is satisfied in the role of a manager. And then you can check whether you can do that on the stages that are accessible for you in the current organizations or in the world. Where can you place that in that manner? So they have a lot uh, of possibilities to think about what to change to improve on personal satisfaction and competence. Do you, do you get the, the main idea? Yes, yes. And I'm proud that I found a personality model that is psychology free. Mm. You certainly can explain many of these things that uh, are told at that point from a psychological standpoint also and can contribute to the discussion uh, also, but it's not necessary to understand and discuss personality in a framework of organizations. Oh, oh, did, didn't, I show, didn't I show that? What, it was not on the screen up to now. Ah, I saw it on the screen. These are the, the five perspectives I've mentioned. This is a question of roles, this is a question of stages, of stories, of topics, of styles of play. Sometimes everything is in order, but a company, for example, has a tendency to put every play on the biggest stage, where it doesn't fit. So the play would be okay if the play would be on a small experimental stage or sometimes they do something on a much too small stage, but it's important to enrich the performances on the big stages. And then you can play around with this model. And you can also use it for the encounter of systems, for example, for mergers. And now it's no longer a personality model, it's a cultural encounter model. And if you discuss to bring two systems together, these are categories you practically can very well discuss it. Which stages will we take from the one company, which stages from the other one, which topics with stories, with roles, with styles uh, are, do we want to mix in what way? So it's, it's still simple but it uh, opens the opportunity to think about this complex matter, sometimes in a really um, essential way. So it's an encounter model. So this was a theater metaphor. Gieson, you wanted to tell something about how, why this model struck you so much? Uh, let me mention that we also experiment a lot with real theatre training. Uh, but we gave that up. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. But in our training groups, uh, there are so many unusual elements of theatre training, actors training, uh, that it takes too much effort to act on that. And so we reduced our um, ambitions to working with the metaphor. And with a metaphor, you can work everywhere. With the real theater methods, you cannot work everywhere. Um, when it comes to the theater metaphor, I also want to make a small clarification. I heard in one organization, they spent a lot of money.
keep on sending a movie director to teach theater to all the employees so that they can use theater as a format in training. I would say that's useless because making everyone an actor or asking them to make expressions and then becoming making them a theater artist in an organizational context may not actually fit. But what we need to have is a theater thinking. That's what Bern uh, stimulated me to use. How do we use a theater thinking to construct a reality in an organization? So how I use, why it was very uh, interesting for me is to, one, we all have to imagine something to convert that into action to make an experience of it. Now this gives me a structured way of imagining things. So how do I do? Instead of having, a, let's say, a conflict resolution, where we are talking about two managers in between, or one level, next level, next level, three managers working together, they are not cooperative. Instead of talking, they are not cooperative. I ask them sometimes, if three, if three of you are on the same drama stage, what do you see yourself doing? Or what happens between you again and again? That is a sufficient dialogue for them to talk about the differences, uh, their collaborations, uh, the difficulties they had, the different focus, and come to a common ground. And sometimes, in order to make intervention questions, like sometimes when few people are talking to me about many different situations, I see them, in my mind, being in the drama stage, and then if they are acting together, I see what is missing there. Maybe one person is always on the stage and not allowing anyone to play at home. Then I don't tell them that, but I frame questions on uh, whose role it is and who may have to do a little more role and who may have to go to the background. So you can use this as a structured way to understand what's happening there and not necessary to teach this but to frame questions. And it's a very useful method to do that, uh, this one. And when two departments are coming together, two divisions are coming together, again this can, because they will be having two different topics as a focus, but here we can come to a shared topic, because we are going to share the stage together. Though we have two different scripts, but at one point there is a common script where we have to play then that becomes an easy dialogical process where we introduce interdepartmental coordination. Mm -hmm. But we have done wonderful interdepartmental coordinations using theatre metaphor, not even keep talking about it, but using as a framework to understand the organization context. And even if we ask them to talk about it, as Burns said, this is one way you can talk to people without using any psychological terms. So. That's how it's been very inspiring to you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, it reminds me to one of the models I did not introduce here. We call it the perspective event model. Um, this is a, it's abstract, but it's our one of our best, but it's difficult to explain. <laughs> so I will not try it, but mention that we have a model like this. And uh, I use a model now uh, for a kind of question you can frame. For example, if you have two uh, departments coming together, you ask both departments what is important for you for the collaboration? Which values, which dimensions, which, which perspectives count most for you? And then we ask them, according to your tradition, who in which roles, on what stages, in what events, acts on these perspectives? Where do you incarnate this? So how do you make, do you make events of your perspectives? And then I might ask the other group, how do you make events out of your perspectives? And let's say a very simple example, if both are HR um, departments, and both say uh, it's important to take responsibility uh, for uh, burnout with your employees. That's, this is a perspective. Then say, okay, 
when you want to go after this perspective, who, where, when does act on that? What kind of events do you create or do you have where this perspective has to be satisfied? And then you can find out that the other may have the same perspective, but they have other events where uh, it is played out. And they can misunderstand each other. Uh, uh, sometimes they think they have to discuss values and perspectives, but they might be not so much different. What they did not realize what is different is the way they are made to events and acted. So you have a much more differentiated uh, way to discuss it. And very often in complex discussions, it's mixed up uh, creating events and uh, accounting for perspectives. They are, they are discussed uh, in a mixed way. And I always say this will give you a, a knot in your head. So let's do either decide keeping one perspective stable and talk about creating events or following through this perspective through many events in the company or let's talk or let's talk about one event and then let's think about which perspective should be satisfied in, in the outplay of this event but don't mix the levels of discussion and this gives very often a clarity people never had before. Oh, I could explain it quite simply. Did you understand? Yeah. That's his perspective uh, event model. So now I come to a classical model. This is the one that is internationally known up to now. The most I know in Japan and Mexico and in many countries. This model is already taught, and this has also to do with the one of my professional homes. This is the international TA community, because they awarded me 2007 for this role model, and I was the first German and the first organizational professional who got an award. So. I always wanted to do something beyond psychotherapy, and this was very supporting for me. <laughs> and uh, Monique Tunissen said that very clearly, Schmidt made TA really organizational, because I always criticize that people just bring personal work with TA, that is wonderful, uh, and they work in organizations, but don't make it organizational. And this is a model it's simple enough uh, that it's easily understand and adopted. And this is a version, I have many models that have a version as personality model and another version as an encounter model. And it's of the same logic, so you do not have to change models when you change from personality to communication and backwards. This has to do with our policy uh, of economics of models. And I'm saying, this is a basic idea, a personality, and this is didactic. This is not a belief system, this is didactic. Uh, a person is a bunch of roles. Eric Burns said, life happens in, with real people in real situation. There is no other life. And this is one of the consequences. Personality is how you play your roles, on the stages on your life, um, during your lifetime. And this is a way, and, and the combination of all these things, this is your personality in action. You may have other understandings and myths about your personality, but this is what happens, and it has also a quantitative perspective. Otherwise, you, you follow the slogan, in principle, I'm really different, but I don't know, do not have time to live it. So, and this is personality, uh, is a, a bundle of roles. And with, within the theater metaphors, is automatically 
calls for the question, what is the play that is played with this role, and what is the world, what are the stages, the contexts in which uh, this is played. And uh, Graham Barnes, this is one of my colleagues who in, uh, many years ago won the um, TA Prize, Eric Byrne Memorial Away Prize, he said, TA as a psychological model doesn't have any future because it deletes content and context. And here this is a model that includes content and context from the beginning. There is no definition of a personality and then being related to content and context. The personality is looked as a role, playing a role with the content in a context. So because it's not divided, you don't have the problem of transfer, transfer afterwards. And this uh, concept came out, as all my concepts, from practical work. I, I did organizational supervision, um, or supervision of prof professionals concerning their organizational wor uh, work. And you always have limited time, so you have to uh, come to priorities from which perspective do you want to do the supervision. And I found out it's diff uh, if somebody has leadership problems, for example, it's a different supervision perspective whether you think about is the role fitting to his lifestyle, to his professional career. So let's not stick too much to the actual problems of being a leader in a specific company. This might only serve as an example. Uh, we put it now in the context of a whole professional life and its development. And this brings up other supervision focuses than as if the person says, no, I, today it's not my general engagement in a professional role, today it's my engagement in an organizational role in a specific organization. And then we have to put all the life back um, background context is uh, in the background and we have to put in the foreground all the context questions around the actual organization. So what is the tradition in that organization? Is the role uh, shaped well? Do you have access to those who can change the role? How is this role interconnected with other complementary roles? All these questions about responsibility systems and so on. And this is why I've divided the professional world in a, uh, the world of uh, work in a professional work and in an organizational work world. <clears throat> and the third is a private world. You certainly could differentiate all of these three in another way. This is just didactic. And from this, uh, you can play around with many questions. So, for example, uh, is, is the engagement in the three worlds balanced for you? Are you ent attentive enough? Or are you always, when you go into supervision, you always work on your private personality or you work your, uh, on your professional role, but you never uh, uh, intro include enough the organizational context you are in? And maybe this is the reason why you make not any progress. You can also use this model um, for thinking about how do the processes in these three worlds interact with each other. For example, if somebody gets sick, then you can say, okay, does he gets sick because the actual pressure in his organization is so high that he cannot stand the pressure? Or is it as high as it was always, but he's uh, becoming a crisis in his professional career? The meaning of being a leader is fading. And this is why the soul is no longer with his organizational role, and this lowers his tolerance. Uh, for the stress in this role. 
or does it is a crisis is this a crisis of professional career or has this to do with his private relationship because his wife uh, moved to another town and he has a problem should he move with her he he did but now he have an additional traveling problem every day uh, and he thought this would be a solution to his marriage but it's, it's not clear whether this is so now he is he's presenting you an organizational burnout problem but this may be interrelated with a professional career problem and this may be interrelated with a private uh, relationship problem or vice versa he has um, private relationship problems because there are stress problems or misfit problems in the organizational role and he feels caught in a specific professional career that he cannot change his organizational role. So I say we coaches are specialists for interrelations, for treating somebody only, somebody only privately. We have different professions. We do not need coaches for that. And this is the same also for organizational consulting and this is the same for education and career consulting. So this is one of the part of organizational coaching. So we are specialists for finding out how we could imagine the interrelations can be. The mo this is a mobile mobile uh, idea of the systemic approach, and then think about where can we do, uh, ex where can we start to experiment with ideas about interrelations that may um, bring the system to a new balance or disbalance a problematic system, bring some movements and we watch what new balance can happen. And this is a personality model you can use to think about these things. You can not do that with many personality models we learn from psychology. This is finished already with the role model. Uh, you, find, you will find on the website <coughs> um, uh, long papers on all the questions around role <coughs> models. This was a very short version. And I just want to point to some goodies on personality we have also in our program. One is uh, a very simple differentiation between a uh, I, I itch preference and an I you preference of a personality. So I am a person with an I it preference. I you is a relationship oriented, I it is a task oriented, correct? Yeah, I would not very one to one translate that, but this has to, very much to do with it. I start with the I start with the IU preference and then I go to the IE preference. Uh, an IU preference, both uh, have valuable talents uh, in relationships. Very often the task oriented person uh, is labeled non relationship oriented. This is not true. But in relationships, the task oriented person is interested first to find on what task should the relation be oriented. And the I you oriented, uh, oriented person is not not task oriented. But the first priority has do I feel fine on the I you dimension? Do we like each other enough? Do are we empathetic each other enough? And if, uh, there's a urgent, uh, if we do not have much uh, space and it's get, we get into a crisis, then it polarizes. Then the I eat personality says, first, uh, I'm only interested in you when you are interested in the same thing I'm interested in. Or, the I, or you have, I'm interested in your topics and you're interested in my topics. This must not be the same. 
topics. But when we want to have an essential relationship over a long time, we should have a sufficient mutually shared interest in something. Because only being interested in you is not enough for me. An IU person might think that only being interested in each other is enough for us. And it might be. So my, um, my wife, and usually because humans have the tendency to marry those that are complementary. So I, I'm an IE preference personality. My wife is an IU preference personality. And we get into the struggle. I certainly want first to fix the, uh, somehow uh, the issue, what we are in struggle about. And then my wife communicates in a way that I consider as crazy. Until I understood that she is not interested in that in the first place. She is interested in the first place that I show compassion with her of some kind and not dependent on an I it relationship. And I learned to be strategic and to communicate that and her craziness fainted. <laughs> then after a while she was able to talk to me about everything in a reasonable way because the basis of her of relationship that is most important to her was secure. Then sometimes I have the problem that when I think, okay, now we have clarified our relationship, now we can more in, uh, discuss our I it issue in more in depth, she loses interest. <laughs> because she is satisfied already. <laughs> so um, we always have to balance that. And it's, it's only not compatible if it's polarized. So, but if it's polarized, then it's difficult to come together. Because I eat as a first, you have to get in line with the topics and principles that are important for me. First, you have to show your solidarity to the goals of our company, and then we can talk about loyalty and taking care of all this. And that's a, first you have to show that you take care of me, otherwise you will never get my passion and will never get my motivations. And so, this is like in Camp David. Uh, so each, each, each type withdraws uh, to a polarized, position and gives this preference as a precondition for coming together. And certainly this is a problem, this won't work. And then they, have, they are full of prejudices against each other. You only want uh, to, to, to couple with people and be, feel comfortable in relationship. You do not want to work, you are not interested in the issues of our company, and, and so on. And she has to say, you only are interested in, in numbers and goals and you use everybody to reach your goals and you have not any interest in people, you are not human and you can have a lot of fights around that. So, do you get an idea? What you can learn, and this is good for training, uh, one is to understand your preference, second is to understand that um, you have to understand the preference of others. And when you want to improve relationship with them, you also have to respect their preference and give some things that they feel satisfied, then they are ready to approach more to your preferences. And the stronger you are, the more you can first uh, leave the first step to the other and invite in their system to come closer to each other. And then it's not so difficult to get them. But it might still be difficult because uh, an IU uh, preference type sometimes uh, is, is not so passionate about um, staying sustainable in being oriented to tasks. And then you have to explain to me it's important because when I feel I've, I'm left alone concerning uh, doing something with topics and with tasks, uh, then it's a disturbance for me in the relationship, as if it is a disturbance for you when you feel I lose uh, any attention for you when I'm fixed on tasks. And so this can help to build up um, 
a better, better relationships. So this is the IH preference type and what we all should be st uh, also still having preferences flexible also to meet the uh, needs of people with other preferences. And many conflicts, uh, I have had conflicts on the top level, top management level that looked as power conflict and most complicated complex, conflicts and it was <coughs> I saw they, they uh, agitate from such a different relationship preference style that they produce one uh, polarization after the other. And explaining them this system and they understand <laughs> why they feel so um, furious at each other sometimes totally solves the problem. They found a new basis to talk about things. And this is uh, also a very different small concept. This has nothing to do with the former concept. Um, this is a concept uh, that came to my mind after meeting 30 years ago Roland Fisher, who is a psilocybin uh, researcher. Psilocybin, that's a narcoticum, a mushroom, psilocybin. It's like LSD. And he said, uh, people have, have something, what he at that time called normopathy. That's uh, the insane way of normality, if they are caught in it. So, and uh, people, if they have any tendency to reach out beyond their everyday normal world and frame of reference and want to be essential, besides all content questions, there are two types to uh, reach that. This is a intensity intensifier type because it's too boring, too superficial, not touchy enough, uh, this type makes things more exciting. So it's dancing or uh, starts a wild discussion, is playing uproar and all these things. And this person feels in some way better because this is a way to pull out of this normal frenie. This, the everyday sickness. But there are other people, when they want to be essential, they want to get quiet. They do not want to have so loud discussions. They want to get slower. They want to have things simpler. And then they get a sense of essentiality. In meditations, uh, the intensity intensifier uh, for example, does Kundalini dance. And this works for him or her. Uh, if you are an intensity intensifier, if you are an intensity diminisher as I am, it doesn't work. For me, things get essential when they, get, when they are slowed down, when they are very differentiated, when there is not much energy in it, then I get access to essentiality. If I would meditate what I do not do, I would more sit in a Zen position. And this works as well. But these two persons cannot together at the same time, in the same room, find their way to be essential. And sometimes this is also true in companies. When they want really uh, uh, find together to come to essentials, the one make a loud and exciting event, and the others try to withdraw and have long walks and talk to each other. And for the intensity intensifiers, this long, quiet thing is just boring. 
and for the uh, intensity diminisher, uh, this shiny loud event is just hysterical. Uh, and this has to do with, um, they have different ways. And you will not, uh, you should not wipe out these differences. They are okay, but if you don't understand, then you, you, you cannot collaborate with, with somebody who is uh, of the other type. And, but if you know that, then you are more tolerant. And then you can discuss with somebody about styles to do things. And in both ways, uh, uh, there can also be just um, um, a rigid pattern because you learn habitually whenever you want to grasp something important, the, um, the intensity uh, intensifier gets louder. And when he still does not feel anything, he gets even more louder. And sometimes even this person needs to understand for this topic in this context to learn, he or she needs to learn a different way to feel essentiality and not habitually go into more intensity. And this is true also for the intensity diminisher. It might be just a, a habit to do so. And sometimes the intensity diminisher is diminishing and diminishing and from outside it might look um, very reflecting but maybe it's in the head it's just nothing. So this person might understand that there are times, topics, contexts, role where withdrawing in intensity diminishing uh, is not the better way to uh, add complementary essentials. So certainly, this is also one of these small little schemata which you can use to discuss with each other's styles of playing together. And it's also psychology free. And I have a lot more ideas uh, about developing models on personality on the basis of biological uh, personality models, biological. Because they found out that even insects have a personality. And with insects you have a hard time to uh, relate this to a good or bad relationship to mother because insects come from eggs and there is no, no, no mother. They more, uh, act more with ideas of role differentiations in systems under specific uh, circumstances. So they address the question of personality and building up a specialized personality and uh, sustaining this specialization along with context phenomena with systemic ph phenomena. I'm not saying this is now right and you, but it's a, an important complementary thinking about personality and personal functioning in addition to what we already have uh, from our long psychological tradition. So how we need to move this excitement diminisher? How we need to move this excitement diminisher kind of people for particular tasks? The normal range of intensifying is excitement. Once more? How? how we need to move this excitement diminisher for yeah. a particular task, for example, if we in my team, say, team persons uh, may not have that excitement towards a yeah. task, so to move into normal range, because it's associated with a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. One way we will do is through dialoguing, or any other methodology to adapt it in terms of approaching this kind of issues. So if I, these are models that are useful to explain everybody what the situation might be and what the task can be. And then I said, you understand from each other that you have a different type. This is not worse or better, but it's different. It's already an important step. And then you can dialogue with this person, um, what the person can do more to move to an era where the other people can connect with but also on the other side. From both sides, they have to move to each other. 
And uh, what, I, what one of my favorite approaches is uh, teach your surrounding about the type you are. Tell, tell them, I might be getting quite more quiet and, uh, quiet and quieter, but this does not mean I'm not essential or not interested. And then, because an intensity um, intensifier decodes it's different when you get quiet. Yeah? And some, uh, and it should, so it should not be a learning culture where the one or the other style is predominant and the other still says they, they are pathological. So you can do a lot, lot on that. Just having this frame as one way how one dimension in which we have to meet if we want to build up a shared reality and a shared style, or at least a complementary style, and not spoil that with uh, unnecessary polarization we are not even aware of. One more, then we are finished. This is, a, this is um, in my model. But it's based on, on, on Jungian ideas. And the personality model of that is, as, as we have also with Milton Erickson and many others, that uh, the conscious me methodical part of our personality is a smaller part. And the bigger part is the unconscious, intuitive. And when two pe and we have an internal dialogue between these two parts, and these two parts uh, should learn to cooperate in a good way. And if it works fine, my model is most of the work is done by the intuitive part, and the conscious methodical part is for safety and supervision, not for controlling the process. And if two individuals um, conceptualize this way, meet each other, then they somehow meet on a conscious methodical level, but at the same time, via intuition, they meet with all these other parts too. And we do not know what else is included in that encounter. But we have to take in account that this happens. And if it's working good, then somehow of the other dif uh, dimensions we are not aware of, we are coming together and somehow find complementary talents, works, issues, and this gives us a base ground that it's easier of, on the level of uh, consciousness and methodic, methodic methods to come together. But we also find on this uh, unconscious intuitive part together in an inadequate way and even in a pathological way what the transactional analysts uh, analyze as games and script collusions and things like that. So as we said at the part of intuition, that is, it's the case that all these uh, forces come into place doesn't say it's good or bad. It may be good, it may be bad, but it's important to take in account that, that on a methodical, conscious level alone, encounters that need back, a personal and cultural background are not a success story. And in order to learn about these dialogues, we need the narrative methods we have all already addressed. And this is a model that gives you an idea about personality dynamics and encounter dynamics that may illustrate that. That's all. And it's open. It, it's not a closed system. You never know where your personality ends. I mentioned already the epigenetic things and so and we have many philosophies that somehow say we somehow our roots meet somewhere in the same floor. So then uh, it's, it's resembles like 
It resembles like uh, communication happening in conscious way and communication happening in unconscious way. Yeah. That's, one, that's what this illustrates. Yes. Uh, but it might be different <laughs> from the perspectives of the different partners. If, if you are well-trained uh, professional, understanding uh, much of your intuitions and observing you two, you both, something is conscious and methodical for you, what is unconscious for the other person. Okay, okay. So you observe more. And certainly you can use that to do, to, to initiate better communications and encounters. But again, uh, for a whole company, it's not enough that we have some specialists for that. We need a culture where this could be uh, shared in many relationships. Yeah. And this, this is why we need a narrative culture. And people are used to that and open to that and learn to differentiate between uh, good processes and problematic processes because only that they are unconscious or intuitive, they are not good. So the whole system learns an intuitive, re uh, acceptable, habitual access to reality. And this might help for a long time to solve your problems. And then new problems may arrive and these habits are not enough. And then it's good that you have a meta standpoint and say, okay, maybe we have to rearrange all these systems to come to new habits uh, uh, that, are, uh, that enable us to meet the new challenges. And this again is an uh, interface between personality and culture. What is Personality for an individual is culture for an organization. But many of the questions I arise uh, are valid for individuals and cultures and organizations. So, thank you for yawning. This makes clear that it's good that this was the last <laughs> chart <laughs> we have here. I know it's, it's, it's really a lot of stuff. Uh, so, I, it's uh, as if there is a um, uh, um, a banquet, and certainly you cannot eat all. But I wanted to show you at least what what is there on the banquet. So if you get hungry again, you remember there was something I did. I was too full to try it, but I know it is there, and I know to find it when I want to try it. And this is why I, I uh, let you suffer a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Keith, and how much time do we have left? <coughs> 20 minutes for break. 20, 20, 20. 20 minutes left, and then we are finished. For break. Uh, and then come together. Okay. Uh, how, mu how much time do we have all together? But? All together. An hour? Or? Yeah. What is the time now? It's it's three thirty now. Three five. Okay. Um, then we have uh, some space that we could do some sharing around the models, right? And you sit together and remember what we had and what did touch you, what the questions are. Did you find yourself in the one or other version of one of these concepts that it, it gets? Uh, alive in your relationships. Okay, sit together as three or four for 20 minutes.